Welcome to Built to Go, a van life podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Wagg, coming to you from the College of Curiosity. This time it's episode 219, and we're going to talk about why you need, must, absolutely must have a physical address if you're going to do any type of full time van lifing, especially in the US. We're also going to talk about laser levels, which are pretty cool things that you'll buy once, use once, and not regret it. (laughs) We'll have a product review of an actual Van Life magazine and a tale from the road involving, well, a long trip. (laughs) Hello, everyone. Welcome back to episode 219. I apologize for being a day late and more than a dollar short. I had an emergency dental experience yesterday. I mean, it wasn't really what you're imagining. I I went in for a cleaning and then they found that I needed a filling replaced. And the upshot of that was that it was uh, more difficult than expected. And I ended up with a numb head and I really want to do the podcast sounding like this. So I decided to do it today instead. (laughs) So I apologize for that. Um, Anyway, I am here. You are here. I think we should do a podcast. So, look, I have received a lot of mail lately, and it has made me realize that we still live in an age where paper mail is important. I wish it wasn't the case. I wish we were kind of like born with an official email address and everything that was important and official went to that email address. But alas, we are not there yet. So if you were going to van life or car van life or live on the road full time, you have a big problem to overcome. And that is, what is your permanent physical address? If you have any run-ins with the law, they're going to ask for that. If you have any type of tax obligations, you need to be associated with a place. It gets complicated pretty quickly, and it gets kind of impossibly complicated because the world is not set up for people to live on the road. Everything in society assumes that you're going to be at one address. For example, let's say you live in, I don't know, pick a state, Texas, and then you drive to Massachusetts and you spend six months in Massachusetts. Well, did you know you were supposed to register your vehicle in Massachusetts after day 30? Yeah, you can only have license plates on a car from another state in that state for 30 days. And if you're living on the road full time, what are you going to do? Keep changing your license plates every single time you go from a state to a state? Uh, No, it's not practical. And the reality is that you're probably never going to have a problem with that because you'll always be able to say, hey, my physical address is in Texas. Except if it's a cop that you ran into two months ago and he realizes that you've been there for three months. You're going to have to sort that one out. But the upshot is you absolutely need a physical address. For example, I got a jury summons. Uh, It's not my first one, and uh, I am not upset about it. I would love to be on a jury, so I actually hope they'll let me be on a jury this time, which I'll bet they won't. Think about that as a full-time van lifer. Let's say that you choose one of the top three states to be a van lifer from, and those states are Florida, Texas, and South Dakota. Now, I'm not going to talk about them specifically. That is a whole other episode. There's a lot of detail there. But in general, those three states make it the easiest for you to declare your domicile in. But you could still get jury duty. So your physical address is South Dakota. You get a jury notification in South Dakota at your physical address. And you're in Florida. You got to get your butt back to South Dakota in order to be on jury duty. Or you can write them and postpone your date. But you are going to have to appear in person at some point. And uh, yeah, it's, it's something to consider. So having a physical address gives them a place to send that jury notification, but it doesn't actually help you solve the problem of being on a jury. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's talk about how you get a physical address. So if you've decided to be full-time on the road, which I applaud, I think that is a fine lifestyle, regardless of society's opinion of it, you have to find a way to be able to receive paper mail and then have the contents of that paper mail get to you, which doesn't necessarily mean the physical mail. This isn't as simple as setting up a forwarding service. I mean, you can do that, but the problem is if you're on the road, you got to keep changing where it's forwarded to. No, what's better is to find a service where mail will be scanned, filtered, and then sent to you. 
Now, the very simplest level of this is the USPS mail service. It's a thing they already offer where you can have your mail scanned, not the inside of the mail, just the envelope, and mailed to you every day so you know what mail's coming every day. You definitely should sign up for that service. It's called Informed Delivery, and if you just search USPS Informed Delivery, you can sign up for it. It's absolutely free, and I love it because it lets me know if I need to go to the mailbox that day, if nothing else. And, you know, I am not home at least half the week, most weeks. So if I find something super important in there, like, say, a jury summons, I will know about it. It gives me a warning in my email, and I won't have to worry about it sitting there. So that's the easiest thing to do. But Let's say I get a letter that looks all official from the government, and maybe it says IRS or something scary on it, and I want to know what's inside it. Well, that free service from the USPS isn't going to help you at all with that. So then you need to look at something like escapees, or texasregisteredagent.net, or post scan mail. There's a lot of these different services, and I'm going to let you do the research on finding out which the best one for you. I'm just explaining what they are. First, I'll give you an address. Maybe it's a P.O. box. Maybe it's an actual physical address. Physical addresses are better than P.O. boxes. Some places won't deliver to P.O. boxes. Just for post-scan mail, for example, they will give you an address and they will accept USPS, UPS, and FedEx. So if you lose your credit card, for example, a lot of places will FedEx the credit card to you. They could receive it. And then they will sort your mail. They will throw away the junk mail and then open the mail that you want and actually scan the contents of the mail and then send it to you so you can act on it. Well, my jury summons... All the information I need is printed on it, and as long as I can read it, I know who to call, when to go there, and all that kind of stuff. That's the vital stuff. You are supposed to bring the actual paper with you to court, but the important information I need is something that can be scanned and sent to me. And I'll bet that if I printed it out and brought it with me, that would be all they need. It's just some numbers. But if I actually needed to have the physical piece of paper, the exact one that was sent to me, I could have it sent to me from post-scan mail. I would just have to say, hey, send me this mail. Now, I have not tried post-scan mail. They're just somebody I found out about, so I'm not recommending them. I'm just saying that this is the type of service that you need. And then you can live anywhere you want, and you will just simply get an email of your day's mail, and then you can let post-scan mail know what to do with it. An ad from a local supermarket? Okay, you can throw that out. A bill? Okay, maybe you can pay it online. You don't actually need the paper mail. That's fine. Like if it's a statement or something. Easy. Like a credit card statement. You actually don't need the paper. And you should probably turn that all off, by the way. If you have the option of receiving things by email rather than paper, go ahead and do that. But for those rare, important mail things, like from the federal government, like I got some property assessments in the mail today. I got the jury summons. Oh, and this is a good one. I got toll bills in the mail. Now, this is a real-world situation here. There are still places in the country where you can't use EasyPass, and I will probably do a whole thing about EasyPass later because it's changed since my last big episode I did on it. But... If you drive, like, say, Denver's got this famous road that it's a loop road that goes outside Denver that if you drive on it, you will get mail to your registered address that's on your license plate with a bill. And if you don't pay it, you get in trouble and they can put a lien on your car and all this stuff eventually. But uh, basically, you should pay it. And I just got one from the state of New York for driving on the thruway, which I don't quite understand because I had the easy pass on the windshield. I still have to figure out if they didn't read the easy pass or from getting double billed. I will figure that out. But at any rate, if I didn't get that letter and I didn't get the contents of that letter, and let's say I was traveling in California, I wouldn't have a way to deal with it. So that's why you absolutely need to be able to scan the mail. But before you consider a service like Escapee's RV or Post Scan Mail or Texas Home, I mean, there's a whole bunch of them. Find a friend or a family member if you can. The people who are doing this most successfully are quote unquote living in mom's basement. Now, I don't mean that literally, but they have an address of record at mom's house or their dad's house or a brother's house or a high school friend's house or whatever. And that friend will just sort their mail for them and heck if you have a really good friend they could just take a picture of all your mail from the day send it to you and then you could say hey could you open this one and tell me what's in there you know you could make some kind of arrangement like that and that's what a lot of people do 
Now, this gets more complicated if you're coming from overseas. I know a, a very popular thing is for people to ship their vans from Europe to the United States and travel a year in the United States. This is something that's much easier to do in Europe. It's, it's easy to spend a year in France if you already live in Germany, for example. But in the U.S., you still have that address problem. So you are probably going to need to use a service because it's unlikely that you have a friend in the U.S. who can do that for you. You might. But you also have your mail at home in Germany or France or wherever you're from to deal with too. So that is a more complicated problem. Now, if you're somebody who is living in a vehicle not by choice, this is your last option. This is where you are. Um, you absolutely need to worry about having a postal address. But there are usually services in major cities that will help you. If you go to any of the state-run or city-run shelters, not necessarily the ones run by churches or things like that, and tell them, hey, I find myself without a permanent address. Can you help me? There are often services available for free where they will let you send mail. And this is very useful if you're trying to find a job or whatever, because you need to have an address for those things. And, and here's one last weird idea that might work for very, very few of you. And that would be to, if you, obviously you have to have some money, but buy a piece of land to park on and make that your official home. Now, you're dancing on some legal lines here, but I can tell you this. In Illinois, I bought this piece of property that I've talked about way too much, and that property didn't have an address. It was just like this property. It had power even, and the power company didn't have an address for it, which I thought was interesting. They just called it X. <laughs> so like you live at X on this road. I wanted an address, so I went through the process and called the county address giver. This was actually a person, that's their job, and explained where the property was, and he said, how about this number? And I said, that seems to make sense. It's the next number on the street. And so they gave me an official address and a letter stating that I had that address. Then I took that letter to the local post office and said, hey, here's this address, and they gave me guidelines on how to put up a mailbox, which I did and I followed. And then I actually took the time to meet the mail delivery person so they knew that, hey, look, there's no house here, but there is a mailbox, so please deliver mail here and I will keep up on it and check on it. And that's what I have been doing. I, I check it at least once a week, and I don't get a lot of mail there because it's not a place where I am officially domiciled. But if I was... If I put that address on things, it would work for almost everything. Now, there's no house there. So if somebody local got into zoning laws and things like that, you know, there could be a problem. But it was an address that just about anybody would accept. I can get Amazon there. UPS will deliver to it. I can just say, leave it by the mailbox, and it's fine. So there are places where you can get a piece of land for as little as a thousand dollars that you can get a mail address for and that will also give you a place to park your van for those nights then you're actually there it's not going to be a great solution for everybody but it might be a good solution for some of you especially if you're living out west where there is a lot of empty land available for relatively cheap point is you absolutely are going to have to figure out a physical address if you're going to live on the road full time and if you don't you're going to run into a bad situation when you get your jury summons and you don't know it and then you get a bench warrant issued for failure to respond to the jury summons and uh yeah you don't want that tech talk so um one of the tricky things in a van is figuring out where level is and i'm talking about when you're building out your van because most vans are raked, that is, the, the back end is a little bit higher than the front end. So if you took a marble and you put it in the back of the floor of your van and let it go, it should roll to the front. That's how most vans are because they're sprung that way to hold a bunch of weight. That's normal. But when you're building your van, you can't use a normal bubble level to figure out what's level because it's level related to the center of the earth, <laughs> but your van floor isn't. So if you use a bubble level and you put up your cabinets with it, they're gonna be off by as much as your van is raised. And so then the argument is, oh, I'll just move my van around until it's level. And yeah, you can do that, but it's not very practical. There is a practical solution to this problem and it's called a laser level. And normally you would take this object, it's usually a little boxy thing, and you put it on a tripod and you put it in the middle of a room and turn it on, and there is a bubble level on it. And normally, you would make the bubble levels perfect 
and then you would know that the lines on your walls that the laser would shine there were all perfect and then you could trace that or just leave it on or whatever i highly recommend tracing it in case somebody kicks the laser level or whatever now in your van you still have the bubble level problem but you still can use a laser level to figure out where you want to be and it would be like this you take the tripod put it in the middle of your van floor put the laser level on that turn it on and then you will have a red usually line that will shine all along you want to measure that line in different points until it's even with the ceiling or the floor, whatever you're trying to match. So you would just take a tape measure and say, okay, it's 40 inches here, it's 38 inches here, and then you would tilt the laser just a little bit so it was 39 here and 39 there, that kind of a thing. But once you mess around with it and get it where you want it, everything on that line is going to be exactly the same distance from the ceiling and the floor and that's what you need for level cabinets at that point you can run a piece of masking tape or use sharpie to make lines or whatever you want to do and that will be your one true line that you can measure from for hanging cabinets and everything now laser levels are the one i have i'll have one linked in the show notes i found it it's similar to the one i have not exact it's like 44 dollars and it's probably something you're never going to use again unless you're going to build out more vans. It's a nice piece of hardware that you will use once. But honestly, 44 bucks to make sure all your cabinets are level is probably worth it. Uh, I have mine from when I built a kitchen in a house once. I, I built an Ikea kitchen and I had to hang all the cabinets. I needed them to be level. That's how I solved the problem. Which was especially important in my kitchen because the floor wasn't level and the adjustability of the laser levels really saved my butt definitely think about a laser level if you have that problem where you want everything to be level related to the floor of the van and you realize you can't use the bubble levels it, it can help a lot product review hey remember donya the truck driver i talked about her a couple weeks ago donya has started something that um well i think the community needs and it's a van life magazine now i've reviewed a couple of van life magazines in the past and they were mostly associated with adventure vans you know they, they were hard copy paper magazines very nicely done but of you know high-end custom rigs overlanding type of things not exactly the same as those of us who are just kind of driving around the country in our vans but still interesting and i still like that but Donya's done something a little bit different and a little bit more associated with what we're doing here which is creating an online magazine called Freedom on Wheels. Now, Freedom on Wheels is an online magazine, but it's not just a website. It's actually like a magazine. You actually turn pages and stuff like that, and you can read it on your iPhone or your iPad or your computer or whatever. And Don has done an excellent job of setting this thing up. It's also very eclectic. It's a little bit like this podcast, and there, there are different sections about different things, you know? So there's places to visit. There might be some tech talk there. There's a nice calendar of upcoming van life events and places to visit. And I have read through the first issue entirely and i think if you are looking for some kind of just kind of nice thing to read when maybe you don't have any internet power you know you've already downloaded this and you're looking for a little bit of light reading before bed or something oh absolutely there is a ton of good content here donya is doing a lot of work to make this happen so she's going to release it monthly the first issue is already done and i'll have a link to that in the show notes and then the second issue is coming soon and you might find somebody familiar writing in that issue i'm just warning you in it uh I, I, all right I, I wrote a little bit about the one and only time i received the knock so if you want to hear that story you're gonna have to get the magazine heck it's only 5.99 and you're helping to support another van lifer here so give it a look and the link i have in the show notes you can see what it looks like for free you don't have to actually buy it to get an idea of what it looks like but if you want the whole episode you gotta pay so again that's freedom on wheels by donya howard it is an online van life magazine and i applaud it i think you should take a look tales from the road this is not a happy tale not a happy tale this is this is a very happy unhappy tale in fact this is a tale from one of the lowest points of my life i was sitting at my desk that i loved very fancy desk in an apartment with furniture that i had handpicked and everything was kind of the way i wanted it when i had the revelation that i needed to leave las vegas 
<laughs> not in the same way the guy in the movie did, thankfully. But yeah, I was living in Las Vegas at the time. I was trying to rebuild my life after a divorce and a number of changes in my life. My job had changed substantially and I gave it a shot and it didn't work. It was a complete failure. And after talking with a friend, I realized that what I needed to do was get the heck out of Las Vegas and move back into my condo in Vermont that I had. That I had a condo there that I was going to sell. And I realized that, no, I'm not going to sell it. I'm actually going to move back into it and break my lease in Las Vegas. Now, this is not an easy decision. It's not a financially wise thing to do. You know, breaking a lease isn't a good thing. And I also had the problem of not having a lot of money at this time. Money is the last taboo, right? You're not supposed to talk about money. I had previously had a lot of money. But at this point, I had realized that a lot of that money was gone. <laughs> so I was trying to figure out exactly how to rebuild my life. And... I had a truck, I had a five-year-old Honda Ridgeline, which is how I got to Las Vegas. Within the course of 12 hours, I decided that I needed to pack up and get the heck out of there. Now, I had more stuff than would fit in my truck, and I knew that. So I had to pick what I was going to abandon. And I abandoned my mattress and box spring, mostly because they were huge. And I had to leave behind some of my favorite furniture. I had all this mid-century modern stuff and, uh, and these custom desks that I had made. And I sadly had to leave them behind. And I didn't just throw them out or leave them in the apartment. I took them to a place that would like donate them to a local organization. And I very carefully loaded them out of the pickup truck and set them there. And then these two guys just picked them up and literally tossed them in the back of a truck. And I heard them break as they were thrown. And, and ugh. I, ugh. Anyway, I don't want to relive that memory too much. But uh, yeah, that's what happened. So I, for 12 hours straight, emptied that apartment, cleaned it. It was perfect. It was perfect the way I left it. And I told the office, look, I'm breaking the lease. I'm very sorry. I will pay what's due on the lease when I can in two installments. I, I gave them the whole plan. And they said, well, we're still going to have to go to collections and all this. And I was like, you know, do whatever you have to. None of it's going to matter. This is how I'm going to pay you. <laughs> and I did. And that was all fine. But I had to get the truck and myself to Vermont. And when I say this truck was overloaded, there was stuff all the way i mean if you've ever seen a ridge line this is the old style ridge line it has the little trunk underneath the floor of the bed of the truck and back and then it's got the weird slope sides this is not a very big truck and i had every inch of that thing filled with something mostly in trash bags i i didn't have enough time to get boxes or anything so i ended up just buying a bunch of trash bags and filling them with everything that would fit in trash bags all my clothes and everything and then all the hard stuff i would put in something else so when I was ready to go, my truck looked like it had this gigantic green piece of broccoli on it, all strapped down. The back was way sagged close to the ground, and from the back you could see the wheels bending inwards. This was completely, completely unsafe. And I was going to drive back to Vermont without stopping. Now when I say without stopping, I didn't have any hotels. I didn't, I just was like driving that's it i had to get back to vermont as soon as possible so i started driving and, and what i would do is that when i got tired i would pull over and just try to sleep in the back of the truck and again i'm six feet long and the inside of the truck is maybe four and a half feet so i was all scrunched up back there it was a four-door truck so i had stuff in the back what i would have to do is take all the stuff in the back and move it to the front seat and then i would sleep in the back seat as best i can uh this was not fun this was fairly miserable, and I remember at one point where I was driving up through Utah, I got a call from my boss who wanted to know why I was moving and why he wasn't informed, which, which he was, but I, you know, obviously I didn't give him much notice because I didn't have much time. Now, this boss and I did not get along at all, and it just added misery to it. I mean, I, I had to explain to him, I was like, look, I have to move to Vermont right now what do you want me to do? And he just, he just wanted me to feel bad. <laughs> that was all. So I finally hung up on him <laughs> and finished driving to Vermont. And I ended up leaving that job a few months later. So anyway, along the drive, I would just pull into places and people would look at me because my vehicle looked weird. I, at one point I had state police following me 
and this was in Nevada actually when I first started the state police followed me for probably 20 miles right on my bumper and then when I crossed the border they stopped following me it was like they they just wanted to be sure that i was leaving the state <laughs> they didn't want to have to deal with me so i just drove about 48 hours straight with just naps not staying anywhere and you know grabbing fast food as i could stopping at rest areas for the bathroom that kind of a thing absolutely not fun at all and then i finally got to vermont and i'm like almost there i'm maybe an hour from the condo and blue lights shine up behind me. Guys pulling me over. Like, you've got to be kidding me. I made it all the way across the country. And now that I'm almost home, now is when I'm getting pulled over. And the, the state trooper comes over to me and asks me where I'm going and what's going on. And I, I told him the truth. I was like, I just drove here from Las Vegas. And I'm sorry if I was driving strangely. I'm tired and I just want to get home. And the guy looked at me, looked at the truck and said be safe and left <laughs> no ticket no warning no citation or anything and that's been actually that's been my experience with vermont cops they have been very very nice to me i know that recently in the news they haven't been nice to everybody but you know i've got the privilege that cops tend to be nice to me at least so far so drove all the way back to the condo and and it just it felt like a ride of defeat you know it was like retreating after a massive battle <laughs> where you had lost i came back with a much less stuff than i had gone out with i had much less money all my prospects were shot and i had to just kind of take all these trash bags and put them in the condo in the rain and i remember thinking this is probably the lowest point of my life right now. This is when everything has gone wrong. I've lost my marriage. I'm about to lose my job because I can't stand it anymore. I'm nearly out of money and I'm completely exhausted in the rain, throwing trash bags into the kitchen of my condo. <laughs> but, but I did it. I did it. I did what needed to be done. I pushed through and now everything's great and everything wouldn't be great now if i hadn't done that then if i had stayed in vegas things would have gone downhill quickly if i had stayed in that job things would have gone downhill quickly and if i hadn't gone back to vermont i wouldn't have been able to get my feet under myself to figure out what i was going to do and then start over and the rest is history as they say so i tell this story just because it, it is possible to survive the lowest moments of your life you can just push through even if you don't know what's going to happen as long as you have time and your health things can get better and you can do nothing better than to just give every chance to yourself for things to get better if you have to drive across the country do it if you have to move into your car do it do what you have to do and it's not fun it's not pleasant but it's also probably temporary i did it i encourage you to do it too depending on your own personal circumstances a place to visit so after that bit of morosity let's talk about something fun <laughs> So, at the very beginning or end of Route 66, depending on how you want to look at it, is the Art Institute in Chicago. This is a world-famous art museum. Some of the most famous pieces of art are there. Uh, you'll see American Gothic there. You'll see Nighthawks. You'll see a bunch of George O'Keefe stuff. It lives there. This is a world-class museum. It's also a school, hence the name Art Institute. And it was founded during the World Columbian Exposition of 1893. A lot of famous people spoke there and has a big, long history. But it also has an area that a lot of visitors miss. And to me, it's the most fun in the entire museum. So the museum, basically like any museum, it has a whole bunch of galleries and stuff. But there's a basement and you will not find Pee Wee Herman's bike down there. But what you will find is the doll rooms. So these are basically, if you go in the main old section of the Art Institute, there's a big staircase. These are under the stairs. <laughs> it's all like Harry Potter's cupboard. You go down there and you go into this room and what you have discovered is the Thorn Miniature Rooms. 
and these are little dollhouse rooms in glass cases. Imagine a room with aquariums, aquaria, in them, but each aquarium is actually a miniature look into a piece of history done incredibly precisely. For example, you can see an English Roman Catholic church in the Gothic style from 1275, and you can look in there and everything is exactly as if you were actually visiting this place, just much smaller, <laughs> a little bit like Willy Wonka. But you can also find a California hallway from 1940. And what's really interesting about these little things to me is that they're not significant in any way. There's no famous people in them. These aren't famous people's houses. They're just this is a hallway from 1940 what a california house might look like and it's based on a real house and so like the california hallway house the lighting the paint on the walls the furniture the carpet all looks like you're looking at the real thing in fact when you take pictures of these things unless you get glare from the glass or you show some of the outside stuff it looks like you're taking a picture of the actual room and not the miniature they also have a French salon from 1780. They have a Cape Cod living room from 1750 that I really like. Having grown up in Massachusetts, I recognize a lot of what's going on in there. They have an English drawing room from 1830 and so on and so forth. And these things were all built in the late 30s by a woman named Narcissa Niblick Thorne. And now they are part of the museum. And they're my favorite part, and you really should go see them. So if you're ever in Chicago and you want to go to the Art Institute, that's great. Go. I love it. Go see all the stuff. But do not leave before you visit the Thorn Miniature Rooms, which are under the stairs in the old part of the building. And honestly, they're good enough that they could be their own very small museum. Resource recommendation. Just as I was about to start recording this, I got an email from Nomad Wiki. Remember Nomad Wiki? I talked about them a while past. Nomad Wiki is a massive wiki, or wiki if you pronounce it correctly, of Nomad Life stuff. It's nomadlife.wiki. You can check it out for yourself, and you absolutely should. And basically, this person, I don't know who they are, actually. They, they don't want to give me their name, and that's fine. I'm not going to pressure them for that. They just go by the name Nomad Life Wiki. That's fine. They are collecting so much data on Nomad Life. Uh, they, they've got 1,423 pages already, and this is better than any book you could buy, for sure. Uh, there's just all kinds of stuff here. The person, Nomad Life Wiki, that's all how I know them, wrote to me and said that I should talk more about people who are forced to live in their cars. And that's true. I, I've talked about that in the past on the show a few times, but not in any depth. And what they did was create this great resource for folks who suddenly find themselves having to live in their vehicle, whether it's temporary or they don't know what they're going to do or whatever. If you find yourself in that situation, like, oh, wow, now I have to live in my Camry and I don't know what I'm going to do. The nomadlife.wiki emergency quick start page is your very first stop. Before you do anything else, read this. It's comprehensive and it is holistic. It explains your situation. It tells you exactly what to do. It gives you all kinds of resources and I, I cannot recommend it enough. This person has done a real service to the community here. I'm just going to read you the big bullet point items that have all the data under them. For example, the first one, and I applaud them so much for this being the first one, reframe and assess. Take time to reframe and assess your situation. Remember that story I told about the lowest point of my life? If I had spent that entire time thinking, this sucks, this is the lowest point of my life, oh, what am I going to do? If I had done that, I don't know that I could have ever pulled myself out of it. But instead, I reframed it as, I've got a truck, I've got my stuff, and I've got a place to stay. Excellent. Let's retreat for a bit and go back and start again. That is help me do it. That helped me get there. Now you may not have those resources. I understand that. But what you are doing is getting yourself into a place where you can start putting things back together. There's no question about that. And this article talks about ways to think about that, that will help you put yourself in a better frame of mind so you can move forward. 
Then it talks about what you need to buy, how to find parking, how exactly to sleep, what you can expect, what you can do to make yourself comfortable, how to keep warm if you need it, what to do for your toilet needs, where to find water, where to find food, how to maintain personal hygiene when you don't have a dedicated bathroom, what about phone and internet, how do you deal with that, how do you manage your mail, what tools can you use, window coverings, electricity, places to recharge devices, safety, security, pets, developing your living space, minimizing belongings, keeping cool services, finding work, on and on and on this is a great resource and honestly this should be its own pamphlet that they give out at shelters in my opinion because this could help a whole lot of people so i'm going to have a link to this specific section in the podcast this week in the show notes but really you should check out all of nomad life wiki it is an excellent resource i believe it's being criminally overlooked and I, I want to spread the word as much as I can. So thank you to whoever is writing this stuff. You are doing a great service for folks. I really appreciate it. And I know everyone you're helping will appreciate it too. Thank you. Well, that's the end of episode 219. Folks, I was in no mental state to do this episode. <laughs> I really pushed through because I had promised it to you. And now it is done. And if you can hear that, well, then I failed. But if it sounds just like a normal episode to you, then I have succeeded. But the point is, you can power through things if you need to. So I want that message to come across as the message for this whole podcast. <laughs> Music, as always, is by Simon Wegg. And until next week, remember the words of Chad Foster, who says, It is your reaction to adversity, not the adversity itself, that determines how your life story will develop. <laughs>